There's no higher name that we can call on but you. The God of heaven and earth, we have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. We worship you for that tonight. Oh, we're so thankful. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We give you glory. Let's lift your hands tonight and worship him. Give him glory. Give him glory tonight, church. He's worthy of all praise. He's worthy of all praise. Let's magnify his name. Thank him. We have so much to be thankful for. You're here tonight. You're breathing. You're moving. God is so good. Let's praise him tonight. Give him glory. Give him glory. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I didn't know that uh, the praise team was going to sing that last song, This Is How I Fight My Battles, but when I was standing down here tonight, I felt impressed. There's someone here, maybe more than one, and you've been dealing with what the Bible calls the spirit of heaviness. That might be despair. Maybe it's described as discouragement. Maybe it's sorrow that you've been going through, or maybe it's a broken heart. I want you to run up here tonight if that's you. We're going to believe that that's going to be broken over your life in Jesus' name. And if you're watching online tonight and you're dealing with that, we're going to pray and believe that God's going to move in your life and that oppression that the devil would like to cause is going to come off tonight in Jesus' name. You know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. We all have battles to fight. And the devil would love to get us in a place of discouragement where we're out of our calling, so to speak, even temporarily. Because if we're focused on what we're going through, it's really hard to be outward looking and focused on what we need to do to minister to others. So God wants us healed. He wants us whole. Every part of our body, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, every area to be a whole person is so important. And that's what God's plan is for our lives, you know. And so if you're watching online tonight and that's you also, I want you to agree with us as we pray for these. But the Lord brought something back to my memory. I'm not, my. you can ask my wife Eileen, I'm not a person that easily gets discouraged or down or ever or feels what some people would call depression. I don't, that's just not something that I've had to deal with personally, okay, very much. But I do remember one time in my life, and it was 1990. I was at a bank, actually in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and a new president came in and fired 13 of the vice presidents in the bank over a period of about six months. And I was like number 12 or 13 on the list. And, you know, I'd never been fired before. That's, I mean, I lost my job in a short time. So it was something that kind of caused me, you know, it, it, it threw me back. I wasn't, wasn't thinking about that happening, okay? Wasn't, that wasn't in my plans. How many of you plan to get fired? That doesn't usually happen. You know, and I, I look back at it and I say, okay, I understand the plan of God was actually using, he can use something that can look like it's a bad situation. He can turn it for good. But I kind of got a little bit into that, what you might call despair, depression, whatever. And my wife laughs at me because she says, and I don't even remember this, but she said, you went out and you kind of, you bought uh, white hot dog buns and some hot dogs and potato chips and just the cheapest thing I could find thinking. And she says, you know, I had too much of a, I guess I had maybe a little bit of a poverty mentality back then. I wasn't quite where I'm at now, but we all grow, don't we? You know, so I was just trying to look at it. Okay, we got to cut back a little while here before we're, because we won't have as much income. But here's the thing that I did know. I knew one thing, and I want to share this with you, and it relates to what I'm saying about this song. This is how you fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. What I did do that was right, even though I didn't know a lot then, I did one thing that I believe just turned the situation around. We had cassette tapes back in those days. Most of you wouldn't even remember what a cassette tape is, but that was like, some of you remember a CD and some of you use MP3s now or whatever to play your music. But I had my cassette tapes. And every morning, I would put on a cassette tape and I would spend a half an hour to an hour and I'd march around my house and praise God. People would have thought I was nuts. 
I raised my hands and I was doing it and my wife had gone off to work. She was fortunately had a job then. We didn't have children, so we had income. But I would march around and praise. And then I would do, that was my super part. Then I would do the natural. Then I went to look to work. Went to work looking for work. Do you know what I mean? Back then, we had to look in the newspaper for classified ads and figure out what was available. But I got resumes out. I went out, pounded the streets. I, I went to banks and applied. I did everything that I knew to do in the natural as well as the time I spent praising, worshiping God, and believing for Him to move. And I believe that's what turned the situation around because within two weeks, I had an offer. It wasn't what I planned. It was an offer that moved me and the family everything expenses paid to Sioux City, Iowa for another financial position. We weren't planning on leaving Omaha, but that was God's plan for us at that time. So why am I telling you all this? The Bible says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 61, put on the garment of praise. That means you do it. You praise God. You determine that you're going to do what it takes to praise God. It isn't always easy. Even if you're feeling in a, dis a state of despair, you decide, I'm going to praise. I'm going to worship. I'm going to bless the Lord because he's so good to me. And you'll watch your circumstances start to turn around, and you can look back on the day that God moves supernaturally in your life. So we're going to pray now, and I'm going to believe that God's going to bless you. We're going to cast that off you in Jesus name, that spirit of heaviness. But in the meantime, remember what I said, when you go home starting tomorrow morning, put on the garment of praise and spend time worshiping the Lord and do what you can and then let God move in your life in Jesus name. Let's just pray for these. This is how I find my balance. 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 For you at home today. I bless you in Jesus' name. I rebuke that spirit of heaviness. I say, come off in Jesus' name. Be healed. May the anointing of the Lord move in your life and restore you to the position that he wants you to be in, which is victorious. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise God, hallelujah. One more thing, I just need to do this quickly. Is there someone here and you have a, a pain in your right foot? right foot pain and maybe it's someone online I don't know but what I'm, I'm seeing is just like I see a picture of a right foot that's kind of like swelling and red and and I don't know if it has it physically is red or you can see red but the pain is that way that it's like a pulsing pain that you feel in that right foot is there someone here and that's you come up here let's pray for you and we're gonna believe that God touches that now in Jesus name and if you're watching online and that's you you receive your healing right now Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We worship you in this place. Hallelujah. If there's someone you're watching and that's your foot, we command the healing power of God into your foot now. I say by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed because of what Jesus has done in your life. You just receive it now. Receive it. Just lift your hands and thank the Lord. For receiving that healing touch now 
And then call us, email us, or write us if that's you, and let us know your good report. Amen. Amen. Well, let's do this. Why don't you turn around and shake hands, find someone you don't know, and introduce yourself tonight. Thank you. It's offering time. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's the most exciting part of a service because you get to plant into something that's eternal and then you get to receive a harvest. How about that? That's just a good deal. You know, um, I was reading a little bit tonight out of uh, the book of uh, Corinth 2 Corinthians, but talking about planting and sowing. But I was just thinking about it, you know, when a farmer plants, you know, the Bible talks so much about planting and harvesting, and, and it, it it's, was written in an agrarian context of, in other words, farmers sowing and reaping. So sometimes if we don't understand the idea of planting and sowing and reaping and harvesting, it's a little difficult to always understand what it is that the Bible's saying. But I just was thinking about it. When you plant one corn seed, Think what you get out of that one seed. You get a stalk of corn. You get ears. You get more than just what that one little seed that you plant. Because that's just the way that God designed it. When you plant seed, you get an abundance. And the same thing is true when we plant seed into God's kingdom. We can receive an abundance. And he tells us to prove him when we do that. And so what a joy it is to be able to give to God and just see God move in our lives. And you know, and the world thinks it's silly. How could you give away part of your income and then actually have more? It doesn't even make sense. And if I just look at it as the natural, as an old banker, it doesn't make sense. How can you, how can you have more with that 90% to live on than you would have with 100%? It doesn't make sense in the natural, but we serve a supernatural God. Amen. He takes that 10% and multiplies it back and sustains us through everything that we endure in this life and gives us more. What a blessing it is. You know? And I think someday when we get to heaven, we're going to find out some really supernatural stories about what God did for us that we didn't even know how he brought us through and how we were blessed. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Ushers, you can give our group here an offering envelope if they need it. You can raise your hand. If you're watching online and you want to partake in giving, we're going to put the information up on the screen for you. You can give by text. You can go to our website. Hit the donate button on the screen. You can mail your offerings in. And we just are so thankful for the thousands and thousands across this nation and around the world that give to this ministry to support what we're doing here in Omaha, Nebraska. We're so thankful for that because it's our partners around the world that help us to take this message out and uh, we will be forever grateful for that. And it's exciting, you know, we were in a building meeting today and they're actually working on footings now. And uh, I, next, next Monday they'll be pouring footings, weather holding. They're going to pour footings to get the thing started, and then we're going to eventually, uh, hopefully before Christmas, see steel start to rise. Uh, and uh, but but it's important right now to pray for good weather because every every time that we can have more moderate weather, it keeps our expenses down. You know, you can pour cement when it's cold, but it takes extra to do it. It's extra work. You have to have additives added to the concrete and you have to put in extra heat and things so it does cost more to do that but we're going to keep on moving we're not going to have anything stop us and uh, we're excited to see that building start to go up and uh, the project across the way here is coming along and we're making progress
progress towards that, and Sunday we'll give you a new update on that total, and uh, so we're just excited about that. By the way, Pastor Hank and Matt and some of our other team are, are still out of town, but they'll be back Sunday, and I think Pastor Brenda's got some exciting pictures to show you and some news about their trip, so we're, you'll be excited to see that in a couple minutes, and uh, so let's do this now. Ushers, you go ahead and um, get ready to serve the people, and like I said, if you're watching online, you can that way let's just pray a blessing over the people and then i'll let you serve them father in jesus name i thank you for every giver in this house online or e-campus throughout the world that gives to this ministry and honors you we bless them now in jesus name and i thank you for a great harvest on their giving and that you supply lord because you can do it through your miracle working power and we believe and trust you in jesus name amen amen so we'll go ahead and receive now and then uh, Pastor Brenda is going to come in a minute and uh, finish part two of her message. And I know you're all excited to hear that because that part one was so good. And uh, we're going to continue learning how to defeat the devil. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. Praise God. Pastor Brenda, why don't you come? Amen. Wasn't that powerful? So good, so good. Well, as Pastor Doug mentioned, our little group is still up in Green Bay. And um, so anyway, so um, they actually got tickets to Thursday's game. So when they came up with this idea, I said, are you really going to be in a hotel for like five days? I mean, <laughs> half the time you can barely stay in a hotel one day pastor is just like a homebody totally so anyway but they did get out so so pastor told matt today he said you know get up and get in the car and i don't know he matt knows everybody in green bay right so you you can you can stop it's all good i'm gonna show some photos so and he's making him sound so emotional <laughs> anyway um but anyhow they're funny photos so we you know we're we're, we're good eddie <laughs> So, but here's the thing. So, um, anyway, so Pastor told Matt, he said, get up and go over the state. I mean, you know, Matt has all these connections up in Green Bay, you know, everybody. If you ever need tickets, talk to Matt Gunneman. And so, so he said, yeah, I'm, I'm going to run over there and go over by the stadium. Their hotel is just close by, you know. And so he gets over there. And you know, he meets players. And, you know, in fact, a lot of people don't know this. Matthew played semi-pro ball and has, um, you know, done practice drills with a lot of NFL receivers. So, you know, he's kind of knows a few folks. So he was super excited. You guys have the pictures? So they, Matt got these today. Wow. Now, only a few of you know who that is behind Matt. That is the one and only Aaron Rodgers that Matthew went and intercepted on his way into the stadium. And he said, I got to talk to him for five minutes. <laughs> Hall of Famer right there. You know, that's Mr. 50 million a year himself. So I don't know. And then they had a couple other ones that uh, I forget who the other one, Matt. I knew I'd forget his name. But anyhow, um, some, anybody know who that other guy is? Oh, Bhakti, that's right. That is it. I can't ever remember how they look without a helmet. So, but I do know who he is. So there it is. Matthew got all those made. So there he got his photographs with the one and only Hall of Famer. Both be Hall of Famers, Aaron Rodgers. So they're having a good time. Matt, did I say it all right? Don't send me a text. I know. <laughs> He's gonna, so he told me, Mom, say this, say this, say this. I'm like, I can't remember all that. So I knew I'd get up here and crash. So, but anyway, so, so exciting. So, but anyway, they're having a great time. So Thursday, they are going to be at the game again. And I'm like, so Officer Herrick was with them for the first game. And he told me on the way out here, he said, I, you're right. I took your advice. I wore all the clothes I had and I was still cold. And did you say Anthony leaned over to you and said, I can't feel my whole body? Is that what it was? Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
And Matt, you know, he gets up there in a hoodie and acts like it's nothing. So, but anyway, I know it's 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 definitely the frozen tundra for sure. For sure. But I'm glad Pastor he's got been able to get some uh, Zepto work done. So he's up there doing some writing in the hotel. He just said it was just good to kind of get away and work on the children's books so we can kind of keep some of that moving forward. You know, it's a big process. The children's books. We really underestimated how much goes into you know, children's entertainment, and, 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 and I hate to say it, I think it's the reason a lot of Christian organizations just don't get into it and do it well, and, you know, he's really trying to break into something, I guess, that's different than just maybe retelling a Bible story, um, and nothing wrong with that, because, you know, I'm certainly not critical of that. I mean, my kids all watch Superbook and all of that. Veggie Tales was a little twist on something new, but so he's just really wanting to break into something fresh. And I'm telling you, he was telling me some of the stuff he came up with on the, a new story. I'm like, honey, we've been married 33 years. I did not know your mind works like this. I just didn't know. I just said so, but anyway, so they're having a good time. So, all right, well, let's get into the word tonight. I'm going to uh, preach. I want to just kind of follow up and do some some real teaching on a topic that sometimes doesn't get um, a lot of time in pulpits. And, you know, we only have so much time every week preaching up here. Um, But just being able to really highlight something that I think in the Word uh, doesn't get enough, are you with me, attention. And that's talking about the demonic or demons and evil spirits. And so Sunday, I just want to kind of give a little, let me grab my glasses here, uh, just kind of a little brief recap for anybody that missed it. And you can go out and see both of the services from Sunday. But, you know, just in thinking about the prophetic word that Pastor had shared, 2023 will be 2023. And, you know, uh, that just that prophetic word just sparked in my thinking the fact that Um, You don't find any place really in the scripture where there is liberty without first a battle. I mean, you just in in just as you're sitting there, just think through, just do a quick run through the Bible stories. You know, the Red Sea, that deliverance, one of the most powerful deliverances of all of scripture where God liberated his people. It came. It didn't come until there was a conflict. And so even all of Israel, I talked to you on Sunday in Deuteronomy 7 about, you know, Israel coming into the promised land and they had to face all the giants that were there. And by the way, it was a multi-layered battle. So don't get discouraged when you are facing something and you feel like you're just keeping having to keep pounding against the enemy because some things are multi-layered battles where they, they aren't won all at once. And we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 7 where it says, little by little, I will drive them out. And we're seeing that in this nation. I mean, I never thought that I would see some of the covers be pulled off in the United States of America. By the way, I mean, nobody talked about the deep state, you know, five years ago. I mean, maybe a little. But now it's like front and center, right? We're just watching all this exposures. And I remember years ago, Pastor Hank prophesying about how, you know, God says, I'll pull the covers back and you'll see who's in bed with who and, you know, who's making a deal over there and who's over there, you know. And, of course, we just had that, you know, how did that go, Pastor Doug, that, you know, weird missile that they found to be the, that went in Poland, that mm, mm, something fishy over there. So, you know, all of these things are just uncovering because some battles are multi-layered and it's to, it's to bring, watch this, an exposure to the devil. Now, people don't like to talk about the devil. I've had people for years, you know, pa- Pastor Hank and I are just warfare oriented. But I had people for years. We started in deliverance. Our, our ministry started in casting out demons. But a lot of people, they just shy from it. You know, they have these weird ideals, like some weird exorcism sort of thing. Or in the church, you know, it's kind of an icky subject. They don't want to talk about the demonic. And I don't think we talk about it as enough. I feel like the scripture highlights so much about evil spirits that if the church talked about it more, watch this, we probably wouldn't accept or get falling into some of the things we accept. We just wouldn't. You know, I, I've just envisioned it like this. If, if you could just tear the curtain back into the spirit realm. 
and see the activity of the demons that are behind certain movies and and things and objects and at and just attitudes, right? You know, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but there's demons that that thrive on strife. And so um, the demonic doesn't get a lot of highlight. In fact, you know, a lot of places, if you go to churches and see their tenets of faith, uh, they don't talk about hell anymore. They don't want to talk about the activity of demons. And yet I found out in studying the Bible, first of all, God has a lot to say about the enemy, um, it, a natural enemy more in the Old Testament. But for us in the New Covenant, it's pointing to something. It's pointing to the fact that there will be opposition against your faith. And we'll have to engage in that battle. You can't avoid it. Satan's not going to avoid it. Okay, he's going to attack. He's going to do. You can pretend the devil's not there. Okay, but he's there. And so I I really want to just highlight the fact that we are going to have to, if we're going to live in in deliverance, if we're going to live free, um, you know, in this nation, we are going to have to engage the enemy. That's just a fact. Can somebody say amen to that? So I want to just kind of recap a little bit. So we talked Sunday about our commission, and I really want to drive this home. I want to just nail this in your spirit that our threefold commission is very important to understand. And Jesus laid the pattern out. If you remember, how many of you remember Matthew chapter 4? He came and he said, preaching and teaching in the kingdom. Jesus went about all Galilee. Galilee means heathen circle. It's a heathen environment. He's engaging the enemy, teaching or, or an opposing atmosphere. You could say it like that. Teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. In other words, God's way of doing things. And healing all manner of sickness. Right? So most people don't have too much trouble with the preaching the gospel of the kingdom portion. A lot of people feel good about that. They're like, yeah, no, our job is to share the gospel, uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And, and then other groups are like pretty okay with the healing of sickness and disease. But then it says, and all manner of disease among the people. Verse 24, and, and his fame, there went a fame of him throughout all of Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments. And those which were possessed with devils. Somebody say Devils. Possessed with devils and those which were lunatic. Okay. We're seeing a few of those on the television now. Just turn on the news. There's lunatics all over. And those that had the palsy and he healed them or delivered them, some would say. So this was what Jesus did. This was the same pattern that Jesus gave to the twelve. And you find that again in Matthew, the 10th chapter, that he commissioned them to go out and verse 7, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 8, and has, uh, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, lepers, raise the dead, and cast out. So there is the attention on casting out demons. And I really want to lay out the fact that this is not always just a one-on-one deliverance session. That's how sometimes we picture it. You know, that we got to, you know, get in somebody's face and command the demon to come out of their eyes. I mean, it can include that. But engaging the enemy in our nation, engaging the enemy in our schools, seeing the fact that there are demons behind things, working, operating, come on somebody, and there ain't anybody, there's nobody that's going to cast them out but God's people. Amen. So he said, cast out devils. And then, of course, later in Luke, the 10th chapter, Jesus gives the same commission to the 70 and tells them to go cast out demons. And interesting, I, and I hadn't caught this until Sunday, but he, when they came back after they'd been out preaching, casting demons out of people, they said, Lord, it's surprising. I mean, we're, we're shocked. The demons are subject to us in your name. They were excited about that. A lot more than some Christians now. And that was the same 70 that left Jesus. But Jesus turns to them. I saw Satan fall like lightning. And he said, look, behold, I have given you power to tread. That word means to trample down to the ground. I have given you that authority. Come on, we should wear our authority to cast out demons like a badge. Amen. 
We should be excited at the opportunity to confront Satan, cast out his demons. Come on, challenge the devil. We ought to be excited about that. Every Christian that bears the name of Jesus has the rightful, God-given authority to cast the devil out. Can somebody shout amen? We ought to be more excited about it. I hate the devil. Come on, the devil is, is responsible for everything bad. Let's not pretend like he's not there. Come on, things don't just go away because we wish them away. No, we're going to have to engage in spiritual warfare. So he said, behold, I've given you power to trample on the powers of the, of the devil to cast them down. Matthew 17, if you go over there, verses 16 through 20, Jesus expected, think about this, expected his, his 12 to be experts at casting out devils. They brought to him a little demonized boy. The, they said, we brought our son, my son, we brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. Why? Because they couldn't do it. That always bothered me. This whole passage bothered me. I thought, Lord, see, because they, I don't know. Well, Jesus teaches the reason. But I think, listen, if we're just going to ignore that demons are there, we're not going to remove them. They'll just be at liberty to continue. Oh, perverse generation, how long do I have to be with you or do I have to put up and tolerate you? How long? How long? I mean, wouldn't you like that? Lord, I couldn't perform the miracle and he said that to you. I know. I know. Jesus, listen, he was harsh sometimes. He was. How long do I have to bring him here to me? So they bring and Jesus rebuked the devil. In other words, he spoke to that demon. He commanded that demon. See, it's our privilege and our honor. The disciples were supposed to be able to do that. It's our privilege and honor to look at what's going wrong in our house. Come on, what's going wrong with our children? What's going wrong with our finances? Come on, somebody. That symptom in your body to stand up against that thing and say, I cast that out right now. Devil, you're not going to bring that disease in here. You're not going to bring that against my son. You're not going to bring that against my daughter. I break your power in the authority of Jesus name and if it's strife come on you ought to I smell a devil in the room come on when there's strife in the house when there's fear going on when there's issues that come on have you ever had a week where there was those little troubling demons Come on, it seems like the little car breaks down, the tire goes flat, and then you get a bill in the mail that you didn't expect. Come on, and, and then all of a sudden, then the refrigerator breaks. you got to call a repair person and take time off work, and this happens, and then that happens, and then you get a phone call. Somebody's mean to you, and, and all of a sudden, you're like, what on earth? It's raining trouble. I smell. I'm going to tell you what you need to do is go... I smell a devil on the loose. Come on, there's a demon involved. Demons are involved in trouble. So they couldn't cure him. Jesus rebuked the devil. And he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that hour. Now, I'm going to maybe touch back on this on Sunday, if time permitting. I'm going to try my very best that the disciples then came and asked Jesus why they couldn't do it. And I don't want to hit on that yet, but let's just talk about the fact that they should have been able. Point to your neighbor and say, you should be able to cast out demons. Come on. Point to your other neighbor and say, and you too. Turn to somebody behind you and say, and you too. If you're saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, you ought to be able to cast out demons. You ought to be able to look at somebody in the eye if they're struggling and say, come out in the name of Jesus. Mark the 16th chapter, verse 15. 
The very first thing Jesus mentioned, he said, go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Come on, every one of us. Here's the commission. Every one of us has an assignment. You have an assignment to go somewhere in your sphere of influence, your Galilee, your heathen circle. Come on, none of us get to be a bench warmer. None of us get to be sidelined. Every single one of us has somebody to touch. Come on, somebody to talk to, somebody to minister to. Every single one of us has an assignment to, to preach this great gospel, this commission. He said, when you go preach the gospel to every creature he that believes in my name in my name in my authority come on you don't go in your own power he said in my authority he that believes not shall be damned but he that uh, in my name these signs will follow them that believe in my name they will cast out demons come on the very first thing not the last thing. The very first thing Jesus said. You're going to go out there and you're going to confront the devil. In my name, they shall cast out demons. James 4, 7, you know this, says resist. Stand in opposition. You know, and, and if there wasn't a lot of demons running around, the Bible wouldn't have to mention this so much. I said this Sunday, Norville Hayes, somebody said, are you just saying that there's a, there's a devil behind every bush? He said, no, there's, I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's seven. There's more demons on the loose than we want to acknowledge. I just feel like it's like this. I had people say, you know, well, if that person is sick, you know, is there a devil attached? You know, and Brother Hagin taught some powerful things of how to discern some of that, that not every single time. But I'd rather assume there's a demon than not. Because I read so many times where the sickness and disease, you read it in the scriptures we just read, all through the Gospels, all through the ministry of Paul, demons were attached to disease and sickness. There was entities present. So I, my feeling is just assume there's a devil. No matter what, that's, that ought to be a part of just about every prayer. In the name of Jesus, devil, you come out. I'm not sure if you're there not there. I'm just going to assume you're there. I'm going to assume there's a devil on the loose. Come on, that person's depressed. I'm not going to just assume that it's psychological. I'm going to assume there's a devil somewhere in the room, and we're going to cast the devil out. we got to get bold like that. <laughs> I know you guys are ready to go to bed on a Wednesday night. We came to confront Satan on Wednesday church. I want to rip the covers back. Resist. Stand in opposition against the devil and he will flee from you. So that means if you'll just do it, if we were just resisting, you know, if you feel, Pastor Doug mentioned that, if you feel that dark cloud of depression it tries to hit you, don't just lay there and go, oh, I don't know what to do. Stand up. Well, Pastor Brent, I just feel so. Come on, nothing in the Bible says we're to go by feelings. You may not feel a thing, but stand up and confront the devil. I remember one time Pastor and I were having a conversation where we didn't agree. And, you know, come on, husbands and wives, don't act like you never had an impasse. So here we are, and, you know, we're vo both very vocal people opinionated to say the least so here we and finally pastor you know he decides to wax in the anointing when I didn't feel like I wanted to and he was going to wax spiritual and he goes right now I mean, here we were just, you know, tempers are getting heated and it's rising and we're discussing and nobody's getting their words in and it was an argument so and, and nobody's finishing a sentence. Anybody? Don't act like you. Okay. Let's talk. I have no idea. It's never happened. And all of a sudden he goes, let's pray. And yanks us, us both down to the floor and goes, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I break your power. You get out of this house right now. And I was mad. I'm mad. I'm like, I don't want to talk about the devil. I'm in the middle. I'm trying to get my point. We will talk about the devil tomorrow. But you know, 
his voice is louder than mine. So he <laughs> continued to break the power. I mean, he called out strife. He called out anger. He called, I mean, he called him out. And, you know, I, I just was, <clears throat> and, you know, what am I going to do? I mean, I'm in the ministry. I'm not going to, like, go, well, yeah, no, we're, we don't do that here. Yeah, when you're the spiritual spouse, you realize you better get in agreement. We're, we're binding the devil right now. And, you know, it took a few handful of minutes. Pretty soon we're laughing. We're like, this is just stupid. And, you know, but the atmosphere shifted the moment the devil left. Can I tell you? We don't, we don't sniff a demon out enough. When things are going wrong and things are happening and stuff's going on with your kids and you're like, why are they struggling? We need to assume somewhere there's a devil on the loose. Resist the devil. You know, and that's the last thing Satan wants us to talk about. Because if one Christian just gets bold enough to, in faith, use the name of Jesus, the Bible says he'll flee. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil is like a roaring, as a roaring lion walks about looking for an opportunity. He's just looking for somebody not to do anything while he's running through the house and ransacking stuff. He's looking for anybody not to do anything in America. He's looking for a group of people that don't want to get up in the heavenlies and confront demons. By the way, don't, and we'll talk about it, but don't let anybody ever tell you, no, no, we can't confront principalities. No, the Bible doesn't say that. Okay, we wrestle not. Anyway, I'm getting ahead, but let me read this verse. 1 Peter 5, it's, it says, Seeks as a roaring lion, walks about seeking an opportunity or who he may, he may devour. Verse 9 says, Whom resist? Somebody say resist. Resist, resist steadfast in the faith. Come on, we're to stand and oppose the works of darkness. And how do we do it? Well, Jesus taught us how to do it. You don't wish it away. You don't hope it away. You don't just lay there. And, you know, resisting isn't gritting your teeth and trying to hold on. That's not, no, when, when uh, uh, Peter's, um, wife, his mother-in-law was sick of a fever, remember, Matthew 8, it says he rebuked the fever. And that entity left her. So there was a demon attached that he rebuked. How do you rebuke something? You rebuke it with your mouth. That's why Jesus said, in my name they shall cast out. So you're going to say, in Jesus' authority. And that isn't just to say, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus, name of Jesus, name of Jesus. I mean, we can do that because the devils hate the name. They don't want to hear the sound of that name. But really what Jesus was saying, in my authority... It's my badge. I give you the badge. The same way I cast out demons, that's what I want you to cast. That's the way I want you to cast them out. He demonstrated it. He expected the disciples to be able to do it, and he expects you and me to be able to cast out. So whom resists steadfast in the faith? So it is our privilege. And it is our honor to be able to confront evil spirits. They're out there, and we have the ability to confront them. All right, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to recap a few things. I left a few details out on Sunday, so let's just preach it twice. Um, Ephesians, the sixth chapter. Let me get over there. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So here's the thing. We don't fight in our own power. Right? Let's establish that. And the reason I say that, and because when it says be strong in the Lord, or be dedicated in the, in the things of the Lord and the power of his might, because we're not supposed to look at our own inabilities. Come on. The devil isn't subject to you because you're tall or short. He's not subject to you because you're a new Christian or a, or a 40-year veteran in the spirit. He's subject to the Jesus in you. 
Get, so whether you are brand new, some of you, maybe you're watching online, you think, well, I don't know about all that deliverance and demons and, you know, I've heard it takes practice. And well, here's the thing, but they're, they're, they're subject to the name. They're subject. If you know who you are. Okay. And, and, and I've heard people say, yeah, but you know, those seven sons of Sceva, remember what happened to them? They didn't know what they were doing and the devil jumped on them. Well, here's the thing. That is like comparing apples to oranges. The seven sons of Sceva were occultists. Okay, they weren't born again, spirit-filled. The Bible said they were called vagabond, Acts 19. You can go read it. The vagabond Jews, exorcists. The Bible uses that word, which means a conjurer of evil spirits. So they conjured up evil spirits on a regular basis. And they thought when they saw Paul cast out evil spirits, that it was just another means and method for them to practice occult worship. Okay, it was another means and method for them to be, to work witchcraft. So the devil jumped on them because the power of God was not on them. But may I prophesy to you, if you have given your heart to God, and you've given your life to Jesus, and you are committed to him, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Come on. When you went, go kalabase, rikabasa kalabase, rukalabase, you received dunamis dynamite power to allow you to cast out the devil. I don't care how big or small that devil is. They might have been exorcists, but we're Holy Ghost born again believers. And we have the same, come on, not a different Holy Spirit. We have the same Holy Spirit inside of us that Jesus had. Are you kidding me, Pastor Brown? No, there is a two Holy Spirits. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You have authority. You just sometimes don't know it. That's what happened with the disciples. They didn't know it. And we'll talk about unbelief a little on Sunday. But the fact of the matter is, oh, and that's a form of unbelief, just not knowing who you are. Well, Pastor Hank could cast out the devil, but I don't know if I can. No, you have the same authority in Jesus' name. And the devil wants, he's afraid for you to just find that out. So be strong and it's in his power. Take unto you, verse 11, or put on, you have to choose to do it, by the way, the whole armor of God. Be good for you to study all the whole armor of God. We don't want to, can't go through it all tonight, but put on the whole, not some. Come on. There wouldn't have, can I say something? I'm going to say it. <laughs> there wouldn't be armor if you weren't expecting a fight. Come on, what, what, what uh, military infantry person, whatever they call them, goes over there in full armor, straps on their firearm, goes out, full boots, gear, helmets, tanks, and expects to eat at a picnic and not do anything. Come on, it doesn't work like that. Okay, Officer Herrick, when you get a call to go out because they said there's been an armed robbery, do you expect her to walk in and shake hands with a guy that just robbed a convenience store? <laughs> That's what you want to happen. But here's the real deal. He's going to go in knowing there could be a conflict. Right? So I don't know where this pacifist ideology came in the church it's almost like you know we don't want to we don't want to make any ways we don't want to set anybody we don't want to you know we don't want to do anything that makes anybody offended we don't want somebody to feel bad if we pray for him and go come out devil i mean you know i we do it here on sunday i just gotta walk down come out come out Come out, come out. I'm just going to assume it's, it's on. It's on the shoulder, maybe. <laughs> and we've done this our whole life. I remember one time, you know, pastor sees in the spirit more than me. 
And he'll always say, oh, I saw one, one time we were sitting in our house. And he goes, and Matthew was just little. He was still in his, he was still in a crib. He could walk, but he was still in a crib. And um, he, he, we were sitting in our bedroom and uh, laying on the bed, getting ready to go to bed at night. And the door to the bedroom was open. We kept it open so we could hear Matt. And all of a sudden, he goes, did Matthew just walk out of his room and go downstairs? I go, he better not. <laughs> and so I ran in there. And, of course, he's still in the crib. He goes, God is my witness. I just saw, you know, he was, and he was taller than Matt. But he says, I saw a curly-haired, with gold hair, individual just walk down our steps. And he goes, I know it was an angel. And, and so, you know, he'd see all things like this all the time, you know. Angels would walk around the corner and he'd spill cookies and all this. And like. So it didn't happen, doesn't happen to me all that much. But I just always assume, assume there's a demon. If they're sick, assume. Assume. Just, just, just assume. If, if you don't get a gift of discerning of spirits, assume. Because something is attached there. And, and so we were in a prayer line. This is quite a few years ago in the church. Actually, I still think the platform was on that side. And we're praying for people and come out, come out, come out. And pastor, you know, and I don't know, maybe it was a deliverance session. Pastor's like, if you need delivered from the devil, come up. So people came up. I guess they all felt like they had a devil. And so I'm going along and I get and I go to put my hand on this girl and I touched her, just brushed her forehead, and I saw a bat fly out of her chest. And, and, I, and it startled me. And, and I realized, I thought, okay, you see, the devil, he likes to hide. He doesn't want you to think anything's there. And I've just learned I'm not going to worry about if it offends people. I'm just going to say, in the name of Jesus, be delivered, be free, be whole. In the name of Jesus, devil, get off of God's people right now. I don't care what you're trying. I don't care what your scheme, your plot, your plan. I don't care what your agenda is. You come off the people of God. Because that's the way I saw Jesus do it. That's, how I, that's just how I see it. So... Put on the whole armor. You're expecting not a handshake. You're expecting a fight. Right? Except we pray over you. We pray the blood over you. We expect you to get a lot of handshakes. We just know you go in prepared for something else. All right, look at this now. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, here, here's, I, I said this on Sunday, I want to repeat it in case anybody didn't hear it, because that phrase has kind of brought out two sides, right? On one side, people are like, oh, yeah, see, that's why you don't get involved in politics, and you don't, you know, the church shouldn't just overstep its bounds in the public square, because this fight is not against those democrats, and this fight is not against those natural entities. It's not against those pro-choice people. No, it's really just against demons, and we've just got to remember that. And it's just, ah, it just makes me gag when I hear it because I know where it's going. It's going the direction of don't get involved in the conflict. And so people have hid behind that to create this, this pacifist ideology from Christians that we should not insert ourselves and make any waves and get our hands dirty and, and, and yet demons are just running free in our streets and in our communities. Come on, they're blowing through the public schools like there's no tomorrow and people have that, well, we just didn't get involved. No, what the scripture is saying is yes, the real fight behind the fight. Because listen, don't tell me Jesus didn't go toe to toe with people even though he wasn't wrestling against flesh and blood. Okay, there was real people. Sometimes you're going to have, well, really not sometimes, most of the time in dealing with demons, there's a person involved. Okay, think about that. So he, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What he's saying is it's not that you're not going to confront a, a human. What he's saying is recognize if you just get your eyes on the fact that that's a person, you'll forget that there's a demon driving them. Right. 
And you better not forget that. But if you get so in the idea, well, it's just all, the, all in the spirit, that you're never going to get out there and, and, and stand to the face. Come on, that's why uh, uh, God told Israel in Deuteronomy 7, he says, no, I'm going to rebuke the evil to their face. And he said that you'll never have to get in the face of a person that's talking with a demon. Right? A person that every time their mouth is moving, you know a demon speaking. So it isn't saying that don't get involved in the natural. We just have to stay cognizant of the fact that when they're acting up, we have to use wisdom. I get that. Because Jesus taught a lot about that. He taught, he said, go out there and be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But sometimes you're going to have to get in the middle and be the obstruction to the demons that are on the loose. Come on, you're going to have to get in the middle of the schools. You're going to have to get in the middle of the fight. And there might be times, yeah, it helps to vote a certain way, but you can't always hide in the voting booth either. Sometimes you're going to have to decide, God, what's my assignment to get out there and be involved? Come on, I, I felt like when, when they're shoving CRT down the throats of our kids and, and saying that, you know, they can use whatever bathroom they want. You know, have these schools that have said that, well, they're going to put in litter boxes for those that identify as a cat. I, my first reaction is, what if you're a dog? Is the front lawn available? <laughs> Come on, somebody's got to talk to this nonsense. And realize, yeah, there's a demon behind it, but we're going to get in the face of the people that are cooperating with devils. Oh. And know that we have authority. Hey, don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. So, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I don't want to re-go through that, but I talked Sunday about those are four types of spirits that govern um, society. And then the, the smaller demons, or what we call low-level devils, that was pastor's phrase. Low-level devils are lower ranking because there's different ranks and order in the, in the kingdoms of darkness. Principalities means first in rank. Arch, enemy, it's, a, it's over cultures, right? I think, well, let me just say them to you real fast. All right. I don't want to get down in the weeds on that part, but um, that they're principalities, powers. Principalities are the demons that govern culture. Okay, if you look at, you know, England, it has a different culture than France, right? United States, different culture than Russia, all of those things, demons over cultures that formulate lifestyles. And then there's powers. We wrestle against powers. That's authorities. That's demons working in active government. And I talked about that in more detail last Sunday. Rulers of the darkness of this world are demons that work in covert operations, under the covers, under the shadows. Okay, we've seen that come to light in recent months. And we didn't know how many demons were working there and flying out to that island and doing all kind of crazy stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Hiding emails and burning them and, you know, bleaching their computers and all of that. We don't know who that is. But anyway, <laughs> spiritual wickedness in high places. That is theos. It, it's, it's talking about um, false gods or, or deities. That's why I'm just so careful about, you know, what kind of entertainment we partake in. So many of these superhero things and, you know, uh, ISIS. Um, these are all entities, uh, you know, in, that we find in the Bible, actually. And all of these are false entities. When I, I see a movie, let's say like a sci-fi, a space show or something, and they have a name of something, some kind of alien. You know, they put names on these things. Star Wars had a whole bunch of names. For all. I always question where they get that from. Okay, I'm not trying to just destroy. I'm just saying demons are attached to stuff. And I just feel like to be, we have to be careful because we don't want to be trying to rebuke the devil and then on the other turn and, and use other ways we invite him in the house. Right? So deities, that's what that word means. So, we're, so these are the four principal spirits that reign in the culture or reign over society. And then, of course, there's other demons after that. In fact, I brought... 
Let me give this to you. Those of you that are in 242 groups would know this from the discipleship book. But I had remember we'd put a list in here. Some of you know this. Let me see where this is because I know I brought it. All right. I got too many papers. We need a Kenneth Copeland-sized pulpit up in here. All right. Let me see. Where did I put that? Demon spirits. We had that. Oh, oh, here it is. Here it is. I see it. All right. Here, here's the, the thing. These are other types of spirits that you see in Scripture, and you can write these down. And this came, I didn't come up with this myself, but this was from a book published in 1976 by Mary Garrison called How to Try a Spirit. Um, and here's the spirits that are, and you find them in Scripture, the spirit of fear, right? We've all heard of that, 2 Timothy 1, 7, a perverse spirit. And under a spirit of fear comes things like fear, horror, terror, anxiety, worry, timidity. Come on, think about the fact that don't, we can't just assume that because a person is shy, okay, that because I know people that are so shy that, I mean, they just tremble at the idea of, of meeting anybody. And, and so, I, and I'm, hear me in context, I'm just saying that sometimes demons get in people like that. You know, they're shy and nervous because something traumatic happened. So they might need some coaching out of that, but sometimes demons get in people. I, I read a story, and I guess we don't have a lot of children in here, but, so I can kind of tell this a little bit in code, but I read a story about a young couple that had gotten married, and this lady had been abused sexually and all manner of abuse growing up. And the couple got married, and she categorically would not consummate their marriage for two solid years. And finally, <laughs> the, man, the husband is like, something wrong here. <laughs> and they went for counseling with the pastor, and they finally identified this whole thing in her history and her story, and she began manifesting a demon. So there was an evil spirit in there that she could not pr appropriately process her marriage relationship now. And so she manifested this demon. It was like demon possession, the whole bit, just like the Bible, foaming at the mouth. They cast the demon out of her, and they ended up having a beautiful, wonderful marriage and came back later and had three children. So sometimes we have to look at things and realize there could be. I'm not saying because someone's shy that they've got a demon right. So, you know, don't run around to people and go, what, you didn't talk to me today? I'll cast the devil out of you. I'm not <laughs> saying you have to do that. But I'm just acknowledging the fact that let's just be conscious, right? So when I read these, think about it, okay? Timidity. Tension, heart attack, all under the spirit of fear, phobias, shyness, nightmares, nervousness. Here's a perverse spirit. Lust, fornication, sexual perversion, homosexuality, lesbianism, adultery, incest, rape, lewdness, profanity. And then there's called the spirit of haughtiness and pride. Under haughtiness and pride, you find arrogance, dictatorship, gossip, contention, egotism, bragging. Self-righteousness, scornfulness, see how flesh behaviors. And actually, when you read in Galatians where it says the works of the flesh are these, it includes witchcraft. Yeah. I know, that hit me one day. I'm like, wow, okay. So these are works of the flesh with demons that work in them. Self-righteousness is under a spirit of haughtiness and pride. Scornfulness, mockery, control, overbearing dominance. Then there's the spirit of bondage. How many of you know Romans says we've not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear? Under bondage comes addiction, bitterness, rejection, a wounded spirit, compulsion, brokenness. And then there's, of course, you remember Jesus said, Luke 13, there was a spirit of infirmity. Remember the woman that had the spirit? It was a demon of infirmity. She couldn't raise herself up. Under a spirit of infirmity is sickness, disease, allergies, fevers, colds, flus, viruses, fungus, lame frailty and then we read a lot about is these helping you i'll just read the rest of them i just want you to know them <laughs> there's a deaf and a dumb spirit jesus referenced that often under a dumb spirit deaf and dumb is dumb speechless suicide epilepsy lunatic mental disorders ear diseases deafness insanity schizophrenia blindness madness bipolar disorders convulsions hmm then there's a lying spirit or seduction. 
And that is lies, exaggerations, delusions, flatteries, vain babblings. Yes, scripture talks about that. A religious spirit. False doctrine. Because the scripture declares that in the last days some will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So there's demons behind that, right? Superstitions come under a lying spirit. Vain imaginations, seductions, blasphemy. And then there's the spirit of whoredoms, Hosea 4. Harlotry, love of money, worldliness, greed, position, idolatry, gluttony, love of body, immodesty. There's a whole lot of that going on. Pornography, voyeurism, sexual lewdness of any kind. And then the scripture talks about, you'll know this one, the spirit of heaviness, Isaiah 61.3. Under a spirit of heaviness comes fatigue, tiredness, sorrow, depression, despair, sadness, grief, loneliness, discouragement, rejection, self-pity, gloominess, hopelessness, and all of those things. And if I'm going too fast, you can watch it later. OVTV. (laughs) There's a spirit of jealousy, numbers five. Jealousy is anger, jealous, rage, violence, murder, wrath, revenge, selfishness, suspicion. Hate, spite, cruelty. And then you'll, you'll know these next two. A spirit of divination, a familiar spirit. And that was all over the Bible. Uh, occult, witchcraft, sorcery, voodoo, soothsaying, astrology, mythology, transcendental meditation. And New Age might be kind of in there. And then Jesus talked about a foul and unclean spirit. Uncleanness. I've noticed that people that keep a really filthy house, sometimes if you've ever been in a place where it's just there's a certain odor that it's not just that you're smelling the dog dewy or there's a certain and there's a demon attached to it. I, 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 and I, I notice that same distinct odor any time I've been in a house where there's an unclean spirit in it. It's the same. And I recognize it every time. It's not that you just you know, smelled garlic chicken from three weeks ago that's still in the pan. It, it just, there's a certain demonic scent. How many of you have ever smelled a demon? I've smelled a demon before. And so unclean, dirty, filth. Okay, that's why, you know, we teach so much clean up your house. Don't allow filth and dirty and, and it's not, and I'm not saying it can't ever get messy in the mail pile up, but I'm just saying, you know, be adamant that you keep things clean and a filthy spirit. I mean, you know, I used to tell my boys, now we're going to clean up this room. I'm telling you, I'm not letting a devil arise in here. I called Pastor Christy one day. I said, I went in the boys' room. I cast the devil out. I threw away all, everything in there just about. And then I, I bound it up and anointed it with oil. So, you know, the, they knew. The boys knew. You know, they keep it clean now. Because we weren't going to allow them to submit to. I don't know what relatives we have out there that had an unclean spirit. But I'm not going to let it come on my children. Okay, they're going to make the bed. They're going to clean up their stuff. They're going to wash their clothes and not smell like dirty body odor. All right. Okay, I'm meddling now. <laughs> Under foul and unclean spirit is stench, ungroomed, come on, bad hygiene, clutter, infestation. All right, all of that. So you can watch that again, but I wanted to get, so it, it just makes you see how much demons are involved in things. Now, let's talk about this and then we'll close. All right. The early apostles cast out demons and it was their honor to do so. Often. They cast out devils. Peter confronted Ananias for allowing, this is Acts 5, I'll give these to you, and you can go read them. We don't have time. Maybe we'll retouch on some of them Sunday. But Peter confronted Ananias for allowing Satan to fill his heart. Did you ever think about that? He said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? And to lie to the Holy Ghost. Stephen confronted the culture, but the demons in the culture, and said our fathers have sacrificed or allowed, they sacrificed their children to Molech. I never caught that before, but if you read verses 19 and 43, Stephen confronted the spirit, the demon behind abortion. That's why we should be as a church just disgusted by abortion. When there's churches, oh, shock that are like not only not standing up against, it's a demon. Come on, this is an ancient evil principality that has aimed, come on, it worked in Herod when Jesus was born to kill the children. It worked in the days of Moses. 
And, and so P Stephen gets up and says, you are our fathers, the leadership of Israel. And you allowed the demon of Molech to kill our children. And I thought, Lord, that has raised its head again. When the church is not outraged, now, and, I'm, and there are some that are and have been and have stood up, but not outraged by the 50-year curse of Roe versus Wade. Come on, there is a principality. That thing has been in the Bible again and again and again, and it's still manifesting. So, you know, when churches and pastors don't speak up about it, I'm like, we're just giving license to the devil. We are, every believer that names the name of Christ ought to be horrified at what abortion is. And now we have pastors, when the whole thing got over, thrown out, not only did some churches not make mention of it, or barely, oh, well, it was overthrown. All right, let's open our Bibles. I mean, we should have been, we, it was a party. Come on, the curse was being broken. The stamp of God is being placed on the nation afresh. But anyway, so, you know, or they either didn't mention it, or now we have pastors that went out and made videos and got on YouTube and said why abortion should be acceptable for some people. As, as a counter, I'm like, you ought to get out of the ministry. Okay, what Bible do you read from? All right, anyway, very quickly, we're almost done. Paul was one of the most prominent confronters of demons. He confronted the sorcerer in, in, in Acts 13 and commanded him to go blind. By the way, you should read that. I mean, that was bold. <laughs> he confronts the girl with the spirit of divination, Acts 16. You can write these down. He confronted the people of Athens for their false gods and false worship, Acts 17. He highlighted at one point, I never caught this, but at one point he highlighted the fact that when he was trying to go see the people at the church of Thessalonica, uh, in uh, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 18, he said, we would have tried to come see you, but Satan hindered us. And he said, so we sent Timothy over there because we couldn't get there due to demonic obstruction. Now, most of us would have said, well, the weather was bad. We would have just assumed, you know, we'll live to fight another day or try to go and not see it as demonic. That shocked me. You know, it would have been easy for him to just chalk that up as just natural circumstances. But he said, no, Satan hindered us. And then if you go on in verse or chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, he proceeds to continue and say, now through exceeding prayer. They had to go to spiritual warfare and prayer. And he said, we'll make our way to you. Night and day, praying, exceeding that we might see your face. So they went to prayer. You can only assume they were confronting the enemy. If he acknowledged it was Satan. So my point is, is it is our privilege to confront the enemy. We need to be people that are on the look. Come on, we are searching saying, is there something demonic involved here? Because if we don't, the world certainly isn't going to do it. No, they're playing with the devil. But I'm just here to tell you, I believe there is a whole army of people arising that are saying enough is enough in our nation. We're going to come together in prayer, and we're not going to just ask God to touch this country. We're going to say, devil, you get out of our Senate. You get out of our Congress. You get out of our White House. Come on, you lying demons sitting in the White House. We break the power of that in the name of Jesus. We're going to confront you. I remember one time, years ago, keep standing. I'm going to end with this. I remember one time, Chelsea, I don't know how you're going to fix this. This is a mess up here. Um, I remember one time, um, Pastor and I, we brand new first started the church. And there was this educational entity that, you know, somebody had come to the church here, got filled with the Holy Ghost, and some parent got upset and all of this. And they... They decided to go out and accuse the church of being a cult. And I mean, and we didn't have that many people. I mean, that church, the church was maybe 50 folks. I'm like, we're not, you know, and I'm thinking, 
how could they accuse us of being a cult? I mean, and so, and it just got bad. And, it, and at one point, you know, we tried to negotiate with these people. We tried everything. We wrote nice letters. Believe me, we wrote them. And we did everything we could in the natural realm. And it just got worse. And the accusations got more. And we got others involved that we knew to vouch for us. I'm like, we're not a cult. And we're a mainline Pentecostal charismatic church. And so they just, it just got worse and worse. And these were a pretty influential group of folks. And so one day we had just battled this and battled this and battled this. Now, if we would have just re realized right at the start, See, don't, don't let the last thing that you do is go, oh, everything's just, you know, the ship's upside down. And like, I think that was a devil. You know, look at the beginning of the story. So one day we walked in from, we were working at the church. I remember our offices were right over there when you first come in. And we got home. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. And we dropped our briefcases. We walked in the door of the house from the garage and I grabbed Pastor Hank's hand. I said, We're, let's pray. I mean, we got, we fell to the floor and probably prayed in the loudest, boldest tongues that could come out of our spirit. And we finally turned and said, I command that devil in the name of Jesus. You come on. That, that's why don't accuse your brethren. Because the Bible says the devil is the accuser of the brethren. That's why keep the strife off Facebook. Come on, stop calling people out because you didn't agree with something. Just get past it. You probably, they don't agree with you either. So we just commanded in the name of Jesus, we bound up. I mean, we said every demon spirit, you spirit of the accuser, you false lying spirit, you seducer that would lie and cheat and steal. We I mean, we called out every demon on the list I just gave you. And we prayed probably 45 minutes at the top of our lungs. The next day, this organization that was calling us a cult dropped everything and said, you know what, we think you're a pretty good church. And there was one individual on the staff that stood up and said, this isn't a cult. This is a, this is a solid Bible preaching church. Now it didn't happen until we confronted the devil. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes you are going to have to go to war with Satan and command that influence to get out of your house. All right, throw your hands up to heaven. Say, Lord, I thank you. I have authority over demons, over devils, over Satan. And right now, I command every demon that would come against my life, you lose your hold. I break the power of every plot, every plan, every scheme, every agenda of Satan in Jesus' name. Devil, you go. You flee. Take your hands off my family. Take your hands off my business. Take your hands off my work. Take your hands off my body. You get out of my mind. I reject you. I bind you. You get out of my finances. Wherever you're lurking, you get out of here. In the name of Jesus. Now give God a shout like you believe it. Hallelujah. All right, well, I like making the devil mad. So Sunday, we'll finish this up and we'll talk a little bit more. We'll finish out and then pastor will be back in the pulpit after that. Uh, but we're going to finish it out. And because I want 2023 to be a time of deliverance and liberty for us. Come on, our communities, our families, but also our nation. We're here to be the devil's worst nightmare. Amen. All right. Hug somebody. Love on them. Thank you for those of you that joined us online. We love you. And we thank God for you. Keep serving Jesus and cast the devil out. We'll see you guys on Sunday. God bless you. Bye-bye.